Okay, uh, this is now lesson number 20. Uh, we're in chapter 18, which is the second half of the prophecy of Babylon the Great, the great harlot that's sitting on the scarlet beast. Uh, there's two chapters devoted. There's more uh, uh, devoted in the New Testament to Babylon the Great than any other prophecy or oracle in, in all of New Testament. So this is something that we really need to pay attention to. And I'll be honest, I thought I knew it until I studied it, and it's been quite an eye-opener. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, we ended last session with uh, just the, the descriptions of Babylon the Great that would have to be met, the scriptural requirements that are in Revelation 17 and 18, before we feel like we have identified Babylon the Great. So uh, that list is, is uh, she's a literal city in a desert, seated on seven mountains. She's distinguished and powerful. Many will marvel and admire her. Uh, she's either a port city or a city that's nearby the sea, so there's a pipeline of trade to and from the sea. She is definitely not a producer, but is a massive consumer. Uh, not only just a massive consumer, but of luxury items. Uh, she's known for idolatry of epic proportions, uh, excessive wealth, excessive luxury, royalty, brazen arrogance. Uh, she is an economic and immoral seducer. Uh, she's known for slavery. Uh, she's known for promoting murder of Jews and Christian. Uh, she, because of her excessive wealth and able to spin it for what she wants, she has dominion over the kings of the earth. Uh, not a scriptural requirement, but because we are going under the assumption uh, that uh, she's part of the Islamic world, uh, she will be a spiritual and financial capital of the Islamic world, and she's hiding in plain sight. So, without uh, any more description, let's go straight into Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he, this angel, called out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen, is Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. So fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Now this is the third mention in the Bible of quote unquote, fallen, fallen is Babylon. Okay, we have looked at it in the past. Uh, the first uh, mention in Revelation was chapter 14, verse 8, with just that phrase and nothing else. We compared it with Isaiah 21. Uh, but now that we're going to go back and look at the first mention of Babylon the Great in Scripture, because this is also important. And surprise, surprise, it's in Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. Um, where it reads, uh, all this happened to Nebuchadnezzar, the king. And 12 months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself has built as a royal resident by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? So, you know, he's already you know, talking about worshiping of self. It's all about me, right? And while the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you is declared sovereignty has been removed from you, and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beast of the field, and you will be given grass to eat like cattle in seven periods of time, which is seven years, will pass over you until you recognize, until you recognize that the Most High, He is the ruler 
over the realm of mankind and bestows on it on whomever he wishes. So I think this gives us a, a, another very clear clue of what Babylon the Great is all about. It's not about worshiping God. It's about worshiping self. Um, so let's move on. Because this scripture also says, well, it's a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. Well, what does that mean? Well, I think it's just a poetic way of announcing future judgment on Babylon the Great. Remember, fallen, fallen is the judgment. And while birds and beasts uh, uh, of, uh, that come in uh, after a war, after carnage, after destruction, they feast what? On the flesh of um, all the carnage of war. And in the words of Jeremiah, what he said was Babylon will be a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals, an object of horror and scorn, a place where no one lives. So let's read on, verse 3. For all nations have drunk the wine of passion of her sex, sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. So there's a lot to be said here of who Babylon the Great is. First of all, the whole world, and that is all the nations, including governments, and um, the powers within governments have been affected by the temptations of this city, as she's known for peddling out all sorts of money. This city has immorally influenced many heads of states. So we're talking presidents, prime ministers, cabinet ministers, senators, uh, high-level government officials with financial incentives for what? For political paybacks. And this city, as we're talking about the power of her luxurious uh, living, she's a major consumer. And companies and corporations from all over the world have prospered greatly by providing their top-of-the-line high-end products with high-end prices and their consultations, partnerships, and services. So this city overall is known for its over-the-top wealth, her extravagance, and her living a life of excessive luxury. But let's focus on the kings of the earth that have committed immorality with her. So what does this mean? Now, first and foremost, let's look at what uh, spiritual adultery, spiritual morality is in spiritual terms. It's worship or devotion, allegiance given to anyone or anything other than God. So that could be a false god, a religion. It could be to a leader, an individual that, that is being held in awe and reverence. It could be worship of self, as we saw in King Nebuchadnezzar, and selfish pride, arrogance, or accomplishment. Uh, it's all about me, and of course we know that is alive and well in the world today. It's also the worship and love of money, the root of all evil, uh, the love of, that is. A reliance on luxury and wealth and money to solve all of life problems and all the challenges that life holds. Now, in the context also of Revelation's Babylon the Great, this would include economic, military, and political compromise uh, by other nations uh, and presidents, uh, joining with her in, in her false religion, okay? Um, like the Hajj. Being a friend, now this is important, being a friend or a supporter or a protector with the supreme enemy of God. And why protect the supreme enemy of God? Well, because uh, she has paid me and I owe her political favors. And then we read on in verse four. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are, high, are heaped high as heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. 
Pay her back as she herself has paid back others and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. So what is this saying? First of all, this instruction is to what? To my people, to God's people. This is a strong warning that's given to Christians. And it's all about her, her sins as well as association with her sins. That's the point. <clears throat> that we can be guilty by association and many are reaping the benefits and are not being per persecuted. Why? Because of their association with Babylon the Great, while at the same time, she's known for killing and martyring Christians elsewhere. So the, the advice is repay her double for her deeds. And this is just part of the pattern of Mosaic law. Uh, we see that in Exodus chapter 22, such as if a man gives to his neighbor money or goods to keep safe and it's stolen from the man's house, then if the thief is found, what? He should pay double. Uh, a couple verses later, for every breach of trust, whether it is for an ox, a donkey, a sheep, a cloak, or any other type of lost thing, of which one says this is it, the case for of both parties shall come before God and the one whom God condemns shall pay double for his neighbor. So God is saying, come clean. Just have nothing to do with her. And if you owe her, well then, pay her back with interest. Let's read on. Verse 7. And she, Babylon the Great, glorified herself and lived in luxury so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. And for this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Now this, um, we read about her in, from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 47, verse 8. Now therefore hear this, you lover of pleasures who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me. I shall not sit as a widow or know the loss of children. These two things shall come to you in a moment. And one day the loss of children and widowhood shall come upon you in full measure. In spite of your many sorceries and the great power of your enchantments or your bucket loads of money that you pay off with, you felt secure in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. Why? Because I'm hiding in plain sight. She believes that no one's aware of her many sins. Well, guess what? Your wisdom and your knowledge led you astray. And you said in your heart, I am, and there's no one besides me. Once again, that worship of self. But evil shall come upon you, which you will not know how to charm away or pay your way out of this time. Disaster shall fall upon you, for which you will not be able to atone. And ruin shall come upon you suddenly of which you know nothing. So a very um, powerful confirmation from the prophet Isaiah. Let's read on in verse 9. And the kings of the earth, well, here's the kings of the earth again, who commit sexual immorality and live in luxury with her, will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. It's because their sugar mama has gone away. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. So this further clarifies and reiterates what we read earlier in chapter 17 when one of the seven angels of the seven bowls came and said, Come, I'll show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth, there we have the kings again, have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. So this kings of the earth is, is being 
iterated and reiterated. And it's something that we really need to take a closer look at, especially in our history, in recent history, because uh, of some of the things that are said here. For in a single hour, your judgment has come. Uh, the ten kings of the Antichrist kingdom are the ones that are going to administer that judgment. They're the ones that are going to receive authority as kings for one hour. And they are the ones that are going to hand over their power and authority to the beast, to the Antichrist. And will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. And of course, we discussed that uh, in our last session. How in the world are ten kings going to just give over their power um, and also become uh, kings as well? Well, in the context of an Islamic caliphate, it's all easily accomplished with the caliph's spoken word. So, um, these kings of the earth that live in luxury with her, um, they, they have grown rich. Why? Because they got a relationship with her. Um, she, in their eyes, in the world's eyes, is seen as a symbol of a culture that brings prosperity, not only to commerce, but also to loyalty. They will stand far off in fear of her torment, so in pastoral, spiritual terms. Let's just say this. Associating with the mother of all harlots, even if it's from a distance, does not exempt you from her sinfulness and judgment. And those that profit from, one, from other sins, such as hers, will also share in God's judgment upon her and her sins. Verse 11. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys her cargo anymore. And listen to this. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses, and chariots. Um, all just luxury, luxury, luxury items, as well as slaves, that is, human souls. So, as we said, uh, Babylon the Mystery is not only a, a, a major consumer of luxury items, but she's also guilty of slavery. Uh, and in today's world, that's both in hard labor and in sex trade. Uh, the NIV translates it as, and human beings sold as slaves. Well, these human beings, by the way, these human souls, they're made in the image of God, and they are precious in his sight. And obviously will be a subject of his judgment on the harlot. Let's continue. Verse 14. The fruit for which your soul, you being Babylon the harlot, long for has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and, and with pearls, which, by the way, we profited from those sales, for in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, so the shipping industry trade, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea, stood far off. And they cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? So God's judgment, um, his use of the Antichrist will be swift and devastating. Now, you might say, how in the world can the Antichrist and the beast be to, like together? 
uh, mutual uh, 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 partners, um, and then be so vicious. Well, we're going to get into that. But this will be a judgment in which those who have prospered from her will also see what happens to her. And a witness of the mightiness and the judgment of God. Remember, God says, vindication is mine. So we'll read the rest of the chapter. There's not much to comment on here because it really reads very uh very clearly, and if we just take it at literal value, verse 19, and they threw dust on their heads, all these merchants, as they wept and mourned, crying aloud, alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she had been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets. Why? For God has given judgment for you against her. All these prayers that have been going up to the Lord, uh, to the Lord, avenge us, Lord, avenge, avenge us, Lord. Those prayers have been answered, uh, at least in this part. Verse 21, then a mighty, mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and he threw it into the sea saying, so will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. So that tells us this, not only she's going down, but she's going down with violence. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpets will be heard in you, Babylon, no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you, Babylon, no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you, Babylon, no more. And the light of the lamp will shine in you, Babylon, no more. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride will be heard in you, Babylon, no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her, in Babylon the great, was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on earth. Very, very powerful judgment and ending. So um, we kind of hinted at the question. Now we're going to put it all on the table. Could Babylon the Great be Mecca or Saudi Arabia or a combination of all the above? And uh, just to refresh our memories in Revelation 17, 4, the, this woman, Babylon the Great, was array in purple and scarlet. Uh, uh, so wealth and royalty and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls and holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery. And I'm sure this is written by God himself. Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. So let's explore this question. Let's look at Mecca. Mecca, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is the spiritual capital of the entire Islamic world. And when I say entire I mean both Sunnis and Shias, even though we'll see there's a lot of friction there. Uh, this is the most holiest city of Islam. Um, their second most holiest is Medina, and, and no surprise, the third is Jerusalem with the Dome of the Rock. Uh, Non-Muslims, they're not allowed to set foot into Mecca or Medina. But guess what? Shia Muslims, so that's the minority, like in particular uh, around Iran, are not allowed also into Mecca. Not allowed. <clears throat> Mecca serves as a spiritual center, though, for about almost 2 billion Muslims, which is about 25% of the population of the world today. And the sacred mosque, it's called the Masjid al-Haram, uh, which houses the Kaaba, 
It's the most visited location on earth. And you might say, well, what's the Kaaba? We're going to get there. But all in all, three and a half, three to five times daily, Muslims all over the world, they align themselves towards the Kaaba and Mecca for prayer. Now, uh, especially those who have traveled in the Middle East or Africa or um, Asia, lots of times when you check into a motel, you'll see like over the door an arrow, and that arrow is for Muslims to know what direction to align themselves uh, towards the Kaaba in Mecca for their daily prayers. So, what about the Hajj? The Hajj, the yearly pilgrimage. Uh, two to three million uh, travel to uh, Mecca for the Hajj every year. And remember, once again, only Sunnis are allowed in this, which obviously is going to create some friction. Now, Islam literally revolves around the Kaaba. Okay, so let's look at the Kaaba, the black box that we see. According to Islam, the Kaaba was a shrine that was built none other by Adam, later rebuilt by Abraham and Ishmael. Interesting. Um, the Arabs and Islam uh, can all be traced back to Ishmael. Now, according to the Quran, this is what the Quran says. Behold, we gave the sight to Ibrahim of the sacred house, saying, Associate not anything and worship with me and sanctify my house for those who compass around it around or stand up or bow or prostrate themselves therein in prayer. And in uh, Islamic uh, belief, they believe that the Kaaba on earth it has the real Kaaba up in heaven. So it's almost like the throne room of Allah uh, in, I guess, a Kaaba is uh, directly overhead. However, uh, in the days when uh, young Muhammad was living in Mecca, this the Kaaba was anything but. It was home to 360 different idols. So it's almost like a god for every day of the, of the year. And later, when uh, he himself conquered Mecca, it is told that he purged the Kaaba of all of its idols and dedicated it exclusively to Allah. Um, a lot could be said there. But the Kaaba was filled with 360 idols when it was taken over by uh, Muhammad in Mecca, well, guess what? The Kaaba was most likely just a Hindu shrine, okay? And some believe that the word itself, Kaaba, comes from the Tamil word, uh, Kabbalishwaran, uh, which refers to the temple for their god, Shiva. And that's who you see on the screen there. Shiva is one of the three major gods of Hinduism and is referred to as the destroyer of the world. She always has a snake that's draped over her shoulder and around her neck. Um, look at some of these meanings. Well, that snake, that serpent, that is the ego. And if, uh, if whenever the, your ego could be mastered, then it could be worn as an ornament. The trident that you see in her right hand uh, these are three powers, let's call them a trinity of knowledge, desire, and implementation. Another copycat here. The third eye is the eye of knowledge. And if you notice that on her head, there's a crescent moon. Hmm, we've seen that crescent moon before. And that crescent moon is the master of time and is himself timeless. So... We look at that crescent moon uh, on Shiva and look at that crescent moon in, in Islam and it's like you can't help but see there just might be a link here. So let's explore that. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we said that there's three major um, gods, little g, in Hinduism, uh, that being Shiva, Brahma, and Vishnu. 
And so the, the symbol of this trinity of gods is called the Om, or should I say Om? But anyway, the Om, the symbol that you see on the right of your screen, um, the top symbol represents Shiva. And it's depicted calligraphically as a crescent moon and a star. Well, guess what you see on top of many, many mosques in the world today or minarets? A crescent moon with a star. Okay. Um, do we have any precedent? Well, believe it or not, we do have a little bit of precedent in Scripture. In Judges 8.21, it talks about uh, Zeba and Zalmunna said, rise yourself and fall upon us, as for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon, so this is the days of Gideon, Gideon arose and killed Zeba and Zalmunna, and he took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. And Gideon said to them, let me make a request of you. Now he's talking to their army. Every one of you give me the earrings from his spoil, for they had golden earrings because they were from Ishmael. They were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a cloak, and every man threw in it the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. Besides the crescent ornaments, there's those crescent ornaments again, and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, and besides the collars that were around the necks of the camels. So we have a case here a thousand years before Islam even became on the horizon. We have record of Ishmaelites, which is the origin of the Arabs adorning themselves and their camels with crescent ornaments. Now, these crescent ornaments, uh, many believe, were representative of sin. Sin is a name of the Semitic moon god, crescent, worshipped in the Middle East religions, who was one of the principal de deities in the Babylonian and Assyrian pantheons. Pantheon is nothing more than many gods. Chief sinners of sin worship were found in Haran and Ur. And oh, by the way, Ur is where Abraham was living when he was called out from to follow God. So a lot of coincidences here. So let's dig a little deeper. There's what's called circumambulation which is the practice of walking in circles around the Kaaba, which we see uh, every Hajj, but it's also every day. Um, the Kaaba is the single most circumambulated structure in the world. Well, where did this practice come from? Well, it's a common practice even today uh, in Hinduism as well as Buddhism, and it's called uh, Pradakshina or Parakrama. The roots, however, they're ancient and they're very, very pagan. There's no biblical, no Jewish, no Christian example of circumambulation. Now, what about the Kaaba itself? There is this feature um, that we need to really look hard at. At the Kaaba's lower eastern corner is a black stone encased in um, a very unusual, unusually shaped uh, encasement. And this is the black stone. Now, Islam claims that this stone, it fell from heaven. It was like a gift from Allah. And uh, here's um, uh, their um, teaching on it. It was narrated that Ibn Abbas said, the messenger of Allah. Now, who's the messenger of Allah? That's Muhammad. Peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, said, 
the black stone came down from paradise. Okay, so we got this stone that fell from the sky. Uh, we actually got a similar reference in Acts 19, verse 35, when the town clerk had quieted the crowd and he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is what? The temple keeper of the great Artemis, one of the Greek gods, and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky. So they themselves were worshiping a sacred stone. And um, evidently Artemis, uh, the statue of Artemis, her head was carved from a black stone. Uh, Artemis is also known as Diana. She's the mother of Zeus. She's a huntress. And get a load of this, a goddess of the moon. Huh. We got a little more linkage with this crescent um, symbolism of a moon god. Now, when Islam rose, there was a lot of... Uh, uh, friction between Islam and Christianity. Uh, and just 30 years after Islam uh, was in existence, we have this Syrian, Christian Syrian monk named John of Damascus. And he wrote the following. They, being the, uh, the Muslims, further accuse us of being idolaters because we venerate the cross, which they abominate. And we answer them, how is it then that you rub yourselves against a stone in your Kaaba and kiss and embrace it? This stone that they talk about is a head of that Aphrodite whom they used to worship and whom they called Kabar, even to the present day. Traces of the carving are visible on it to careful observers. So, very, very interesting um, accusation here. First and foremost, um, only Jesus can absolve sin. No stone can absolve sin. Anything beyond our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is an abomination to God. But what about this uh, Aphrodite? Well, uh, was it Aphrodite or Artemis? We don't quite know for sure. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of both, uh, but here you got the black stone of Kaaba uh, shown on the left, and here's one, uh, uh, a black stone, what's called the black stone of Aphrodite that's in a museum somewhere back in, in Europe, um, that, um, well, it's something that we need to take note of, and very possibly uh, this monk uh, was, uh, was really quoting fact that uh, this stone actually came from a statue of Aphrodite. So anyway, according to Islamic doctrine, this stone does have the ability to absorb and forgive sins. And in uh, the teaching of Islam, Ibn Umar said, I heard the messenger of Allah, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, say, touching the black stone is an expediation for sins. What? Just touching this stone is an expiation for sins? Are you kidding me? Well, there's more. According to Islamic doctrine, the black stone is going to take on life and stand as a witness on the Day of Judgment either condemning or acquitting the sins that it has absorbed from those touching it. You can't make this stuff up. Here's the Islamic teaching. Ibn Abbas said, The messenger of Allah, Allah, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, said concerning the stone, quote, By Allah, Allah will bring it forth on the day of resurrection and it will have two eyes of which it will see and a tongue with which it, the stone, will speak and it will testify in favor of those who touched it 
in sincerity. Wow. All I can say is expecting a stone to take on life is a classic definition of worshiping an idol. So, in summary, Muslims from every nation make the Hajj pilgrimage each year to Mecca. Uh, I think the peak before COVID was uh, like 3.15 million to kiss a black stone, believing it brings forgiveness of their sins. This is idolatry. Every day also, Muslims around the world bow towards the Kaaba and this black stone in Mecca in prayer to Allah. I'm reminded in Revelation 9.20 where it says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, what they did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Enough said there. So now we're going to look at the wealth of Babylon the Great, but um, in doing that, we're going to split this video in two and take that up in part two.